Hey everybody, it's uh, Eugene Lisho here, and uh, hopefully we're not having too many problems with the internet here. It sounded a little skippy there at the front, but uh, I want to welcome you to the third episode of Forensics Talks. Uh, this is a series of interviews where we invite people who are forensic professionals or working in the field, and where we discuss technology, we discuss their work, we talk about research, and all kinds of issues in uh, forensics. My name is Eugene Lisho. I'm a 3D forensic analyst at AI2-3D and um, I'm located out of the great, greater Toronto area. Now, just before we get started, uh, I just wanna make a few uh, little announcements. And the first one is that Forensics Talks happens every Thursdays at uh, 2 p.m. And so make sure that you subscribe. This is an informal discussion. We just have an open conversation. And so if you have any comments or things that you want to uh, include or whatever, by all means, please just drop them into the comments section and we'll do our best to answer some questions. I'll, I'll check them every now and then. Um, there is a couple of announcements. So one of them is the IABPA. So that's the International Association of Bloodstain and Pattern Analysis. And what I'm going to do is I will bring that up and I want to show you that they've just announced their uh, conference. And that particular conference, uh, if you go to their website, it's IABPA. Dot org and uh, if you go into the conference page here and then go down to annual conferences uh, there's a call for abstracts so at the moment you can't register but if you're interested in presenting by all means please uh, please do so and check that out also uh, next week uh, we're having our shooting reconstruction week and so there's going to be a series of videos that we're going to be releasing about shooting reconstruction and if you're interested please go to my website uh, ai23d.com slash register and just register there and what you'll get is some emails uh, that uh, that come out to you uh, with uh, links to those particular um, videos and uh, don't forget that webinar on September 21st okay so today I have uh, Mr. Alex Harvey, and he is the co-founder and creative director of um, River. And uh, let me just remove the stream here so I can get back in. Um, if you haven't heard about uh, River or reality and virtual reality, uh, they do some pretty amazing work in uh, uh, VR and, and Six Degrees of Freedom and all kinds of stuff. So uh, really, really interesting. Uh, at, uh, Alex has experience in the games industry. Uh, they've done work for the BBC, for the uh, Ford Motor Company, and his job is to guide the River brand and online presence, and they do a ton of stuff online. So if you've ever gone onto LinkedIn or to YouTube, you'll see that they have all kinds of videos and all kinds of information uh, that they uh, they have provided. Um, he's very passionate about the digital camera, about uh, videography, and uh, not so much being in front of the camera, but I, I, I feel he's the kind of person that is really interested in creating things with uh, the camera. And there's a quote here that I have from him that says, I love the feelings and memories we can evoke in VR when technology, creativity, and innovation collide. On that note, uh, Alex, hey, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Hi, Eugene. Hey good there. Good to meet you again. Um, yes. We haven't met in uh, person for a while, but online is good enough. Yeah, well, unfortunately, now it's all online. So uh, we met in, uh, met in Germany. I think that's where yes. we first met in person. And I had the... Uh, the experience of trying out one of your systems there and in VR, and I was really, really impressed with the uh, the 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 quality of the, uh, the the VR experience and also the interactivity and that sort of thing. Um, we're going to get into that stuff. What I'd like to ask you is just give us a little bit about your background and kind of how you landed in this in this role that you're currently in. Yes, um, it was a it was a bit of a mixed start. I. Uh sort of went through all the all the rubbish jobs that you could you could basically name um but then finally found what i wanted to do when i landed at codemasters and uh from about 2000 and 2005 onwards i was at codemasters making racing games but i was in the video team there i was making their promotional trailers so it was very much my job to drive around in uh in these cars on in a, in a in a game all day all day long um and then detach the camera from the car and then work out how to make a nice trailer for sort of tv cinema and online adverts so sort of pushing things online like you mentioned about linkedin that's probably a lot of where that stuff comes from 
But in 2014, we started a production company first called Infinite Pixel that was doing mainly 2D and drone videography trailers. But then we moved into 360 video production and we started River. And um, yeah, we started doing lots of things uh, promotional wise for one of the ones we did that in the early days was for Thompson Holidays, the TUI, the holiday company. Okay. So we went away to their cruise ships in the Caribbean and two of their aircraft in the UK with a team of about four or five of us. And we basically 360 videoed the whole of their cruise ship, all the rooms, um, on board the plane to show the extra leg room. And anyway, that's how, that's how we started River Link. Um, that was its first incarnation, if you like, because they wanted to show it in the holiday shop so that four people could experience the same holiday at the same time as a promotional trailer. And okay. then we started doing much more photogrammetry and uh, six degrees of freedom virtual reality work for people like the fire service, um, DSTL, part of the home office in the UK. And we did some crime scenes for those guys. And we're on to about our third scene with them now, with DSTL. Uh, but they're very much one-off jobs that we do for them. And they're not public, so we don't get to talk about those very much. Um, but the fire service is where we've really shone, if you like, with the photogrammetry and the training, the mix of the two. And right. that's a product that's been going going really well. So there's basically three strands. We've got Riverlink doing uh, classroom training in 360 video. And then we've got River Investigate doing six degrees of freedom training again, photorealistic and multiplayer. And then we've got basically we do bespoke builds for people so we can create a scenario or a promotional video basically for anybody we can scan anything so we've got a lot of historical preservation stuff going on in the background as well so uh you mentioned that at one point you had a team of like four or five people whatever and you've got your hands in i know many different areas so what is your team comprised of today and sort of what are the different components that they're working on to make all this happen and like to put it all together yeah, so now we're at 15 people. We're going to be going to 16 at the end of the month with a new programmer because that's an area we've had to upskill in quite a lot. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of artists, a couple of photogrammetry guys, a couple of drone pilots, coders, programmers, and also the bit that I'm, I have to say is amazing all the time and I forget about is the back-end stuff, you know, the emails, the, the, the calls that happen. Uh, and there's there's a lot of the team, Brad and Paul especially, that take care of that for me. Um, and then there's a whole team of 360 videographers. Um, there's like four or five of those guys. And they're going out all the time doing shoots. Because when people say to us, OK, we want to have the training facility of River Link, but we don't want to shoot our own content, we go and do it for them. So we produce video uh, from start to finish. Um, the other the other week, the guys were on a train track doing a video for Network Rail um, about trespassing on the lines and things like that. So they, it's very broad. Um, there's so many different companies now that are seeing the benefit of 360 video. I'm so pleased that it's now taking off because I've been beating the drum for VR for so long. Um, it's just we've got these two levels. We've got 360 video and room scale. Um, and it seems that the 360 video is taking the bigger adoption first, um, but I think eventually they will merge into the same same piece of hardware. Yeah, well, I don't know if you remember, but like way back when, when VR sort of just kind of started coming out, I think part of the problem was just the quality of what you were exposed to. I mean, it wasn't yeah. photorealistic. It wasn't, I mean, they were boxy, yeah. and graphics weren't that great. It was all kinds of problems. So maybe, um, like for example, maybe you can comment on the, the the technology, the consumer technology that we have today. If somebody yeah. wants to go out and say, "Hey, you know, I want to get started with with some of this stuff," what kind of options do they have, and what's what's a good option for them? Well, just touching then on, you know, the 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 way that the quality of it has changed so much. That was a an initial bugbear for me when we first started the company because I left Codemasters thinking, okay, three sixty video and room scale stuff, we can. We can really make something there. But at Codemasters, we were always striving for the most realism, uh, you know, f graphical fidelity as well as like physics and things. And then I come out of there making 2D games and we go into VR world and then everyone's producing, like you said, 
uh, it frustrated me that everyone was producing cartoon games like the Simpsons type games when I knew that there was photogrammetry around, but people uh, just didn't seem to be in the early days mixing VR with photogrammetry. You know, there was a few people, um, realities.io, that was, uh, and Simon Shader Boa. These were the first two uh, people and companies that I saw online that were actually doing it. But the thing they were missing was, for me, they were missing the interactivity. They were producing photorealistic scenarios, but you couldn't pick anything up. It was a very static uh, scene, static tour. So I thought, um, if we if we take that same concept, we can then add interactivity to it and lighting and smoke and, and, and effects to try and just add more and more movement because movement's hard to do in a photorealistic scene. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so I want to talk about two things in particular. So one is the investigate and the other one is river link. And I want the people who are going to be watching this after to understand the differences between them. Cause I'm not sure it's, it's, uh, yeah, everybody's yeah. familiar with you. So, and there's, there's people from all over the place here. So, um, before I do though, what is the process of getting something into VR? So if we're talking about, regardless of what it is, if it's a crime scene or a fire scene that you've been working on, there are several steps. There's different technologies that you're going to be using along the way. You've talked about 360 video. I know that you're very passionate about photogrammetry. You post a lot of stuff like that, but um, there's a lot of background work I know to creating different models and getting them to work properly in a VR environment. So maybe if you can just step through a little bit of the process so people understand the scope of what's involved. Yeah, you mean for the six degrees of freedom investigation yes. stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the fire service, I'll, I'll use the fire service as an example because it's one that I've spent, you know, the last three or four years in. The, the, the whole fire service training for fire investigation is normally done uh, inside a metal container, usually out the back of the fire station or sometimes at a fire ground, and they dress it like a front room or a kitchen or an office, and then they set fire to it, and then they let it burn to a certain level, sometimes further than uh, others, and then they, they, they let it put the fire out, and then they go in and investigate that fire, and what they're trying to do is learn about the smoke patterns and fire behavior, and how things move in that space. Um, but there's there was a restriction with that because they could only go in and look at stuff because there was other people going to come through that crime scene, uh, the fire scene, later on that day or later on that week. So it, this looked like a perfect thing that we could copy um, for, in photogrammetry. So Paul Spate and Leicester Fire Service were the first ones we worked with to create these scenarios. And we went down to one of their burn facilities. So this is now, okay, we've, we've seen how you do your training. We think we can do it in virtual reality, but now we need to do the process that you talked about to get the things into VR. So we go down to Derby and we do a burn with Paul and the guys from there. Um, and the next door to the burn container, which was a metal, metal container, we set up a photogrammetry rig. So the rig is a turntable it sits with a load of lights around it and it has 12 cameras in a, an arc around the turntable and then we turn the object and we take three four five hundred photos of each object um, under good lighting conditions and try and de-light it so that there's no shadows and then we bring that into software the one that we've been using <clears throat> using mainly is capturing reality and um their software, well, the company's reality capture, um, or the other way around, I get confused. Um, but their, their software is one we use. So we put those um, photos into the software. It, we align them first so it knows where all the positions were on the camera. And then we make a reconstruction of the data and it builds us a mesh. And then with the nice D-lit texture, we can lay that on top. Um, and then we can take the model out of the photogrammetry software and into things like Maya or ZBrush to clean to clean them up and retopo them. Now I know that Reality Capture has got a lot more uh, features recently, so there's a things that you can do in there. So we're looking at different ways to speed up that workflow, because you do have to quite often optimize the the geometry so that when you're viewing it in VR, you're viewing it in its most optimized state. So we can basically have it dark or light or um, 
there's lots of different maps that they apply to it to, to make it more optimized. Um, so each of the burn containers might contain 70 to 150 items. So there's a lot of items to do. Um, so last year we spent, uh, we released it last year, but the year before that we scanned six different scenarios. So we did it six times with um, Jason Dean from West Mids Fire, and he was our advisor for the six burns. Um, so we did it six times. The guys got uh, extremely dirty, and we spent a lot of time at our facility um, burning things and putting them out. We also have a sniffer dog that comes in and does the 360 sniff around the scene to see if there was any accelerant used in the scene. It's just a nice little addition for the training guys to see. And two out of the six have uh, accelerant, so it's, it's cool. And then that software has now been used. We had a user meeting the other day, a user group meeting, where we had, I think it was six or seven different people from different countries of the world all dialed into this call. And we were just discussing how they'd like to add features, um, what things were beneficial for them. It was really interesting to, um, to hear their feedback. But then I guess it leads on to a video I think you've got where we're just about to start testing uh, live multiplayer. So within, uh, within the River Investigate system, at the moment, uh, the investigators are training people one-on-one -on -one in a classroom scenario. But now, as you see from this video, you'll be able to train with other people from anywhere in the world, still in a photorealistic scenario. This is me and Ross making a bit of a mess. <laughs> yeah. It's good because you can see the environment that we're talking about here. And there's the dog and the burn. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think yeah. that's important for like what you're talking about is it's not a simple process. There's a, there's this documentation. You do the burn. You have to pull out all the individual pieces that you're going to be interacting with. You have to, you know, re document them somehow with photogrammetry. You have to retopologize them. Basically, for those that don't know, it basically means that you create a mesh structure around this object. You need to simplify it, clean up how it's going to look in terms of the textures that are around it. And then you need to you need to drop it into your 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 software or or the way you're, that you're going to repackage all these things so that people can interact with them. So it's it's not a a, a trivial thing. It, it's quite a it's it is a, a bit of work. I, I know uh, somewhat of what's involved and 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 you more than anyone. So um, yeah. let's since we're talking about investigate, let, let's get on to that. There's there's two products, and I want to talk about both. So there's investigate, and then there's Riverlink. So investigate is six degrees of freedom that means you're you're fully immersed in an environment and yeah. you have control so maybe you can tell us uh, more about the investigate yeah so at the moment investigate is on vive and oculus so we can we've been dishing out uh, demo licenses to people that want to try it um, but it's mainly at the moment for fire investigation or arson investigation uh, if we're if we're american um but the, the thing that it is doing is allowing you to pick up things in the space and interact with anything in the scene. And we're using a Vive at the moment um, and also Oculus. Um, but obviously, we can see a point in the future when things are going to get... Uh, it's going to be able to use... We're going to be able to use the, the inside-out tracking headsets. You know, so we won't have to have the cables... And at the moment, we're installing uh, like a big PC or a laptop into a uh, into a venue with the lighthouses um, that you can sort of see up there in the corner. So it's a little bit of an installation at the moment. Um, so I'm always keen to look at how that can be sped up and uh, streamlined a bit. So as we move into inside out uh, headsets, more like these type, these are are tracking much more on the headset looking out, whereas the previous generation of headsets are being tracked by lighthouses and sensors looking in. Um, so this eliminates one part of the process for installation that I think is going to be really beneficial. But also, Eugene, the investigate at the moment is only focused at fire investigators and arson investigators, but we realise that quite often around the world, those jobs are done by police as well. So we see that Investigate is going to be, it's going to evolve into a product that 
is not just fire. It's definitely going to be going into the, the crime scene world, you know, not a lot more of uh, your your environment. But the the key thing we're pushing for is after COVID as well, I think that um, the new product that we've got coming out, which is called CSI Sandbox. So we're going to be able to give you, it's going to be built into Investigate, if you like, underneath Investigate. So the police might want to use the fire scenes or vice versa. Um, but it's going <clears> to, <throat> because the fire scenes have an origin, you have a source of where the fire comes from. So we have to create the scenario because it's real. We have to create the scenario where <clears throat> the fire started. But with crime scene, I've spent about two years in the crime scene world working out how they do their accreditation and crime scene training and um, all the things involved in that. <clears throat> and they really need to be able to dress a scene themselves, place objects in a crime scene for training themselves. So the thing that I can see happening with that, we're going to be releasing next year two, ex two experiences first, one pre-built crime scene that's already made and one sandbox crime scene where you can move things around. But we've got one, <clears throat> well, a few cool features. It's all photorealistic, exactly like River Investigate. But you can now bring in different types of bodies. So imagine if we've got a scan of you or anyone, a casualty. That scan can then be brought into the CSI sandbox. I can place the body on the sofa. And now I can grab the arm, move the arm around, and place the arm and hand and neck and head exactly the position I want. I can lay blood, weapons, and drip these things into a photorealistic scene, <clears throat> and then press save. You know, so you're saving that scenario. You lay all the items from an iPad into the scene, however you'd like them to be. And then that is what the people, um, I think, are gonna um, really find value in the, in the six degrees of freedom crime scene training world. Right. Because at the moment they have uh, crime houses, as you know, people, the police have these houses where they have to take people to the house and dress the scene. And one of the accreditation requirements, if you like, is that every time the people do this training, it needs to be consistent to the training that happened before. We can't be accrediting people on completely different scenarios. So one thing virtual reality does is allow you to do that 100 percent accurately. You know, one thing I was going to say was that um, from a there's no doubt VR has immense value from a, a training perspective. And I think that's currently why, you know, you guys are so successful. But I can see and maybe you can see something in the future where let's say, for example, uh, there, there's some kind of a, a crime that happens and then there's people who want to revisit that scene. How difficult would it be to you know, use your platform to, you know, somebody has a laser scan or photogrammetry and maybe it won't be fully interactive, but at least yeah. that they could be immersed and, and walk around and experience that scene. Is that something that would be fairly possible? Yeah, I think we've definitely, I think me and you have spoke about this before. Um, I see that as uh, sort of mid to late next year when we can have, after we've done the CSI sandbox, we're looking to have the ability within the river system to have the multiplayer features and the VR features available for ingesting of point cloud data. So from any one scanner, I can see a point when you can load that straight into the river investigate system and now navigate around it in VR, you know, with a controller, with another person, you can measure things and take photos. But like you say, it is never going to be unless you go and take, 6,000 photos in a crime scene from every angle, it's never going to be a photorealistic uh, representation with interactive objects because you just haven't got the time to scan everything. But a laser scan would gives you amazing data. Yeah, so you move on to this, yeah. Yeah, so, I want to show people uh, what you know, something that you, you, you showed me here and the quality of what you can get. Eugene, can you just go full screen for me on the video? Yeah, sure. Hold let on. you do that. Yeah, cool. That's cool, yeah. So, like I just mentioned about crime scenes, there'll be a pre-built crime scene, one where you can't interact with objects. You can only interact with the objects that are relevant to the investigation. Uh, so there'll be about 20 objects you can interact with. But the rest of the scene, the, the clutter, if you like, in the scene, it's important to me that it looks as real as possible. So we've, we've realised that 
when you do scenes like this with baked in lighting, like you won't be able to change the lighting in this scene. It will be as it is, but they just look stunning. Like this, you can get down and put your nose into the dogs. Not that you'd want to, but you know, this, <laughs> this is a fully interactive VR crime scene that you can look under the sofa if you like. It's even got a nice, yeah. So this when, we're working with, we're working with another partner at the moment that is allowing us to capture these scenes and we're going to be doing something in the future. We're just um, working on that. Um, when you talked about the multiplayer before, because I think that's interesting when you can have two or three people, but what are some of the sort of the, the technical limitations as to how many people you can have in and still get decent performance in one particular scene? Yeah, so at the moment, you're right. We've tested 10 people uh, in the scene and it was fine. Uh, we haven't gone past 10 at the moment, but as soon as you start throwing in lots and lots of objects or lights or movable and everyone's physics are getting, you know, distributed between 10 people at the moment, yes, we are finding it would get a bit laggy. So I think at the moment it's probably not for mass amounts of people, but definitely coming up to sort of tens and twenties for now. Okay. Let's, so let's talk about the the link system because that is something that is highly scalable, right? Like I think uh, I'm just, let me share my screen because I'll, I'll show here, but there's some uh, you can get on the website and I believe it's this link right here, the riverlink.co.uk. And um, let me see here. Uh, let me add this here. Okay. So you should be able to see what we have here. This is the type of headset that we're talking about. And it says here up to 64 synced headsets. So if we're talking about using a system like this at a trial, or if you're talking about for teaching or something like yeah. that, yeah. it's a no, it's a no brainer to have 20 people then. <laughs> yeah. And this has not just been developed like really quickly. You know, this has been developed from what I mentioned earlier from you know, three years ago doing the software for Thompson Holidays. So now it's developed so far that it is a Peli case full of headsets that we ship out to people. And they are being, like yesterday, 12 went out in a, in a big van. Um, so they're going out really, really fast. So what you're seeing here at the moment is the view of someone inside the training scenario. And you're seeing the person, if you like, on a Zoom call, uh, talking to you about what, they, what you're going to talk about and what you're going to do in this lesson. You can raise your hand and talk, and now he's just jumped into a 360 video. So this is now a blue light run in a fire engine, but we can also see the instructor talking to us. You can turn that off as well. That's a feature that you can have on or off. But you, so, can, be, you can pause things as well, and I think he does it now. And also when he's on his screen, he can circle things and highlight things and everyone is seeing the same thing at the same time. So 360 video in this case is, is obviously really important. So we don't need to create, I mean, I guess you could create a 360 from uh, point cloud data or laser scan data or something, but obviously the quality of the 360 video nowadays is, is really quite excellent. So uh, yeah, using 360 video uh, mm -hmm. is, is a simple way. So you could use panoramic images. Um, you can even, can you integrate things like I don't know, like documents or, for example, regular photographs and uh, yes. what else can you integrate? Yeah, so like I said, the, the guys are busy out filming loads of uh, promo trailers and, and training videos for people in 360 video. That's a major part. But um, another part that I think is important is that people don't get scared off with virtual reality because, you, because it's too expensive to make content. So we, we provide shooting kits for people. So... Um, the Royal School of Artillery, uh, as an example in the UK, have three different, three shooting kits. And the shooting kits contain basically a 360 camera. This one's just the GoPro Max. So it's a Peli case full of equipment, everything needed. I think there's like 428 gig SD cards, um, some lights and a tripod to stand things on and harnesses to attach it. And they're going out and filming their own content. So as well as having your own content that you can shoot in 360, you can also, like you saw in the cinema screen a minute ago, when people are inside Riverlink, they can look forward and see a 2D video. So you can load 2D uh, video, 2D photos. You can put a presentation on the screen. You can also highlight things on the screen. It's like uh, an extension, um, a VR extension of Zoom. Uh, that we made, we had to add the the remote bit after COVID because some people 
don't want to use it in a classroom setting. They want to send the headsets out to people at home and allow them to log on uh, and have the same learning. Interesting. So um, I'm thinking about using something like this at a trial. That that to me is is just something I think that is interesting. So, but obviously, let let's say for example, the ideal situation would be if the police, while they're investigating the scene, while the scene is still active, if they could go in and walk around with a 360 camera, take video, take 360 photos, they take their regular crime scene photos, they could integrate all of this into a uh, you know, a, a, a documentation awesome. package that you could give to the jury for them to experience and walk around. Um, I want to bring something up here and I'd like you to maybe comment on this here, but this was a, there, this is a 360 video inside of a courtroom and I can play this video and I can also move around. So, uh, tell me what you're thinking here. What was the purpose of this particular video? Yeah. So, uh, this was part of a project we did for, with steps drama and transport for London. Um, where you start off, it's a bus driver training and it's a cautionary tale. So as well as showing, um, as well as showing 360 videos of hazards and things in London that bus drivers might encounter, we needed to show a tale of, um, of how that bus driver felt throughout a day and the decisions he made through the day. So th you start off in this scene where you're in a courtroom having to talk about an accident that you've had. So if you just press pause on that, Eugene... Yeah, just because the next scenes are quite dark, but the courtroom is interesting because if, as you look down here, you can see that we did it first person like we did in the some of the Thompson shoots. Right. And these sort of things are really good for empathy. If you're doing training, it's really good for the person to feel what it's like to stand in the courtroom. Now, I know what you mean. You're talking about police potentially scanning a crime scene. Now, there's two ways they could do that in an ideal world like we've spoke about. I'd want someone to go into a crime scene and shoot a 360 video in every room, a 360 photo in every room, and do a laser scan in every room. That would be ideal. But I think um, the way that people could shoot stuff with a 360 camera would be simple enough for a jury to have a scene that's so much more understanding for them in a headset. But yes, you could, you could have the police capture a scenario, uh, every scene, as soon as they turned up, if you like, or a few hours after, whenever whenever you can get access. And then that same video, instead of having to take everybody out to a location, which I know they do in some places, you could just show 12 people in a courtroom at the same time. They could all be seeing the same content and you could highlight the things, um, you could fast forward or rewind. We use it for location scouting. So I, I guess it's the same type of thing. We put a load of people in the headset to see what a place is like so we can work out where we're going to take the cameras and things. It would be for them to understand the crime scene. Right. Oh, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, and in terms of in terms of somebody leading other people, it could could, for example, a an attorney say, OK, look, I'd like you to follow me through this scene and I, I lead it's sort of like a guided tour they would lead the way and then they bring you to a position and then you can look around is that how it works or well you think the thing is i think if you try to put a jury into six degrees of freedom where they could walk around in a scene or follow the solicitor if you like the lawyer i think that would end in a nightmare i think that uh i think it would be too much of a jump for the courtrooms to be able to go from seeing a 2D video in the courtroom to doing a six degrees of freedom. I would think that would be amazing. But I think what we've seen with um, lots of integration of VR is that companies and big organizations like to take baby steps first. So a three degrees of freedom, 360 video would possibly have to be the first way you get VR into a courtroom. I, I've seen lots of people have objecting of things like you know even laser data being used in courtrooms uh meshing the laser data and things like that i think it would have to be a stage one stage two yes it would be ideal um but you could still use laser data within river link in a courtroom because you could do like a 360 uh panoramic render of a, a move through a point cloud mm -hmm. so you could go really slowly through even if they had laser data and see that stuff but i think it would be best to have just 360 photos of a scene that would be adequate to to get people to understand that you can give people 
an experience of a place all at the same time, like, and then just press stop. And, and they could be jumping through locations. When you say about doing a tour, I think it would be fine for them to, right, now we're going to go to the front room. Click. We're here. Now we're going to go to the, the kitchen. Click. We're here. Rather than having them, you know, I've seen lots of systems in VR that uh, turn scans into tours. And as you skip to the next hotspot, um, it gives you this effect as you go through the space. Right. I think you can turn it off, but that's not good for people that have not tried VR very much. Yeah, you get the effect of the the, the motion sickness or the, the sickness of having it on. And I've I've experienced it myself playing some different uh, some of these beta games or whatever. And yeah. especially when there's like huge elevation changes and things like that, and you're moving rather quickly, you get that that lag, and then all of a sudden, yeah. You want to take that off pretty quick. So, uh, yeah, if you're definitely not used to it, that that could be a potential issue with uh, with you know six degrees of freedom uh, in in VR for sure. Um, what's the largest uh, group that you've ever put together on Link so far? On Link, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The the guys did an install yesterday when I came in the office, and it was forty six. But we've tested seventy eight. I see on the website we put a number that was a little bit less, but. Yeah, we've tested 78 total. Um, we only ever had, I think, 78 in the office. There was a, a big order. We think we can do more, um, but at the moment, um, we haven't had a need to go over, you know, those amounts. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of uh, now. I can, I can see like a, a virtual conference in 360 where, you know, yeah. you, you broadcast it over the internet, and then anybody who has a headset can get on. You know, potentially yeah. you could have hundreds of people. That that's but that's super interesting. I did um, I did twelve yesterday. Uh, we were filming for BBC Click yesterday in Leicester Fire Service, and me and my brother were filming the video for that. And we we ran twelve different headsets, and for one person setting up twelve, that's about enough for me. You know, if there's two or three people in the classroom, you could probably get to do more because you have to like hand out all the headsets and. Once everyone's in, it's fine. But if you're trying to do it on your own, you probably need two of you. So to to date, though, has anyone used the system at trial? Or do you know if anyone's actually used it at a trial? Definitely not our system. I'm not sure that anyone else has. Um, but I'd love to give it a trial <laughs> at a trial. You know, we would. I would completely, like I've said, we could send you a demo kit. And also we've got, um, we're partnered with Dali, WS Dali in America. Who also have demo kits over there. So if there's anything in America, Canada, we could definitely get a trial, a trial kit over. If you had some content that you had someone that was willing to show, they wanted to you try it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think uh, yeah, better be careful. You might be getting a lot of offers. All I of said, yeah. <laughs> they also said Eugene that um, when we someone spoke about courtrooms before. And I think that if we did a, there's a few places around here that have courtrooms <clears throat> that we can go and film in. So I think that if we shot a promo trailer showing 12 jury members in headsets with a judge pointing at the screen, blah, blah, blah. I think if we showed people how it would happen, I think people could visualize it and maybe, maybe go for it a little bit easier. Okay. Hey, I want to take one of the questions. Uh, somebody's uh, popping in here and asking about 360 photos. You know, are, they have great quality 360 uh, photographs, but how close are we to affordable, high quality video, 360 video, that is? Yeah, it depends, obviously, how much you want to spend. But the, the cameras we use for 360 video production shoot 8K. And we use Insta360 uh, 2, and we also use the QCam. I think that's how you pronounce it, QCam. Um, so they're the, the more uh, professional ones we use, but they're like the QCam. I think is about eight nine hundred pounds UK, and the Insta is maybe three or four thousand. Um, but I shoot with the GoPro Max all the time, and I'm fine with five point seven. I think it's five point seven K video, um, and I'm fine with that in a headset. At the moment, the, the headsets can't show much more than that anyway. We often have to scale stuff down for headsets. Um, so I think until some headsets come out, a, a 400 pound GoPro Max is like, seems to me like that's, that is a winner. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there is um, a cheaper option. 
There is a the Samsung camera. You know, you can buy the Samsung cameras now for two hundred, even a hundred pound. The for the old, the small ones. We've had to burn a few of those, <laughs> just in the in the fire burns that we were doing. Oh, you, you kept them. You to, kept them inside to yeah, record the video. <laughs> and they got too hot. Okay, I got you now. Yeah, so I guess that's that's survived. Um. So, but in terms of the for value or for a consumer camera for you know if if, if you're going to spend a, a thousand couple thousand dollars what what would you recommend yeah for resolution under a thousand pounds you can get the qcam which that we one now, use okay. i should have bought one to show you um but that is the one that's highest resolution and it's like the old rico theta that used to be quite thin mm -hmm. uh, it's the same sort of design but a bit fatter whereas the insta is a big massive ball which is good as well, but I mean, we we hung that off the front of someone for a first-person camera the other day, and hung a Q cam off the back, so we could have 180 back, 180 forward. Um, so yeah, Q cam if it's under a thousand, but over, we use Insta 360, and both of those cameras are really good. I also for 180 3D, which we haven't touched on much, but I use the just for in my bag the Evo. Insta 360 Evo, and, and that you just out. you're just taking the okay. So it's just a one. Is it a single lens and? It can be a 360 camera, or it can be a 180 camera, and you just choose which one you want, and it it does great. It's just great little 180 3D. Something about 180 3D that is, I think it's underused. Um, I think it can be really effective. Is is the qual is it do you gain quality? Is that what happens because it's one eighty? Yeah, you're using the whole of the screen to mm -hmm. show one eighty rather than the whole of the screen to show three sixty. Interesting. So you can do some like up and over or side by sides, depending on what's more optimal from how you've shot. Um, and if you get that right with two SLRs and do one eighty three D, it's absolutely crystal clear, even in like a Pico G2 headset, um, it's stunning. I think it's underused because people want to look around all the time. Yeah. Well, let me ask you another, uh, or maybe one last question. Um, I mean, where or what is uh, River going to be working on in the near future with respect to the forensics area? I mean, you, you talked about a couple of things, but what are the next few steps for you guys uh, in the near future? Well, it's basically in the for the crime scene stuff and the forensics it is definitely the sandbox CSI where we're creating the dynamic bodies, the photorealistic scenes, the droppable blood around the scene. Um, and those things all have recordability. It's important for the, uh, the trainers to be able to see what the trainees did. So we can record the scene from any angle. We have a thing called VRM, which allows us to watch the person as they're doing their training and walking around the scene like we saw in the investigate video. But then you can press pause afterwards, rewind the scene, fast forward the scene, press pause and move the camera around the person. So it's like a spatial recording that you can go back and look at in VR or on a 2D screen. So they're the two things in the forensic world that we're really looking at. And for me, I'm massively all about the accreditation i want to work out um the accreditation world so we've been meeting with different people and listening and hearing about things um skills for justice and ucas and there's lots of changes with the isos so 17020 at the moment in the uk i think it's, it's a worldwide thing i think um that is going to be a big part of our of our development over the next few years. The after I speak to the universities quite a lot in the UK and the ones that do the crime scene uh, training courses who now can't use the crime houses because of covid are asking their assessors how can we now how can we now do this training how can we now do these reaccreditation and these competency testing uh, scenarios if we're not allowed into the crime houses and I've heard that some of the assessors have said, use these uh, photos that you took at the previous uh, time you went to the crime house. So I want to speak to the, um, the different bodies 
to show them investigate and we've been you know lucky enough to show quite a few of them and the the feedback's positive that um this is a much better way of accreditation if you can record the whole scenario than if you have to look at old photos of a crime scene. Eugene, I think you're muted. I am. I did it again. Um, it again. Yeah, no, look, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I realize it's later there and I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like for those that are going to be watching this uh, now and even later, uh, just head over to the uh, the River uh, website if you want to find more. There is no shortage of information uh, with River. They're on LinkedIn. They're on YouTube. Uh, go to the website. They have a whole bunch of excellent information and definitely uh, a company to watch. And uh, I'm, I'm really eager and hopeful, uh, Alex, that in the near future, we're going to see maybe the River Link or something like that used at a trial. I can see it's just, it seems to me like it's right there and it's ripe and it's ready. So I, I'm hoping that's going to happen for uh, for you and for the people in forensics. Yeah, good. I think it could really help. I think it'd be great. So let me know if there's anything that I can do to help or send you a demo kit. I mean, we spoke about that before, but yeah, thanks for having a chat. And uh, like always, I'm always up for talking about things. All right, think, excellent. Uh, Okay. No shortage of bouncing ideas off you. That's for sure. That's excellent. Well, look, thanks. I'm just going to make a few announcements. Uh, if you want to hang back, I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with you in a little bit. Yeah, cool. All right. Thanks again, Alex. Well, look, folks, uh, that uh, that's episode three. We just finished. I want you to hang back uh, or at least uh, next week. Thursdays at 2 p.m. We're going to have Dr. Etiel Dror. That's our episode four. And we're going to be discussing cognitive bias and how that affects uh, people working in forensic science and knowingly or unknowingly. Um, so uh, if you don't know Dr. Dror, he's done some excellent work, uh, very well published and does a ton of research in that er particular area. Also, uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe again. Um, and also, don't forget about the IABPA virtual conference. That's November 16th to 20th. Just go to IABPA.org and you'll be able to find that. And finally, we're having our shooting reconstruction week starting this Monday, ai2-3d.com register. And uh, that will conclude this particular episode. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. See you next week.